Creative Not Corporate.com proudly presents the Creative Not Corporate Pop Culture and Media Podcast, chronicling the ongoing pop culture battle between the creative minds of music, movies, TV, and radio, and the corporate suits that control them. Now, please welcome your host, a digital media professional with over 25 years experience in all forms of traditional and digital media, not to mention managing two of the largest online radio podcast networks on earth. Here is the king of podcasts. Needless to say, I am back rested and relaxed after a decent sized vacation to the Dominican Republic over the weekend, about four days, three nights. And it was really great. Lots of Presidente, lots of great food, great weather. Couldn't have asked for better. Leave it at that. But I'm back. And I know I needed a couple extra days just to get things settled and get myself back in the saddle. So I am here to give you another Creative Not Corporate podcast. Couldn't go ahead and go away without doing that. That's just not my way of doing things. All right. So let's go ahead and get along and tell you what's going to go on the show today. Marvel box office fatigue. Might have come at last. The network's going back to the basics for their TV upfronts for this season. Coming up. The 10 most popular shows on network TV after the end of the season and how old they are. Plus some social justice stuff going on in music and radio. Gender equality music radio. And retiring the N-word for good. That's all coming up. So let's go and talk about it. First of all, Deadpool 2. I got a chance to catch it before I left for the DR. Weird how that worked out. But I had to go and clock out of work. And then I happened to go and catch a Regal Theater on the way down to Fort Lauderdale Airport where I caught my flight. And the flight was a late night flight that was what at almost midnight what I had to catch. So that was one reason I had a chance to go and do that. I just had all that time. So I caught myself a 6 o'clock showing of Deadpool 2. And it was as pretty as, but about as funny as the first one. It was definitely different. You kill off the girlfriend at uh, the end of the, uh, the start of it. You know, spoiler. Okay. But the thing is, is that, you know, the whole story of trying to get it all back. The jokes were there. The storyline was there. I enjoyed it. And I will admit, there was something I liked about seeing Domino out there. It's just a very interesting looking woman. Beautiful. And good part. And then seeing the uh, Derpinder again, back again. So the, the remember, memorable roles. That was really fun and cool. So all that in the play. We had a pretty good storyline going on for it. And the build up. And there wasn't much more to it. It was just, you know, let's just keep the jokes rolling. Throw him, throw him, throw him. Ryan Reynolds just is is made for this role. He fits it so well. Van Wilder in a mask and and, and donning a, 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 a superhero uniform, a superhero suit, if you will. And he just did really well. Now, again, this is what, the fourth or fifth Marvel movie we've seen this this year? We, I mean, when you just put ahead and had the previous month, and you just got this big windfall off of Avengers Affinity War, and then you bring this back. Right now, there's currently three Marvel movies in theaters because people are still trying to catch up also with Black Panther. I mean, you still have a lot of movies that are out there that are people trying to catch up, so it is Marvel all the time. And it's Disney's idea of doing it because that's what they want to do. They want to have it out there and they want to push it, push it, push it. So Deadpool 2 has the third highest opening of the Marvel films in 2018. Actually, the third biggest opening of the year of all movies. Third biggest opening for a Marvel film after Black Panther and Avengers Affinity War. Both started over $200 million domestic. Now, Deadpool 2 had a lower budget, $110 million, about double the 2016 original, opened over $300 million worldwide. So it broke the bank. It did really well. But according to the story from IndieWire, there are signs of fatigue because the growth came in a little under expectations. People really thought, well, you know, this is a comedic sequel. It's an R-rated film. 
no surprise factor to it. So people are making excuses for this. 26th Century Fox in the case, the initial crowds were 61% male, which shows that a film with strong male appeal can still create a success. However, the spirity means the film missed the mark somewhat with women, comprising 50% of the comic book movie audience. So they're thinking because it was catered more towards males that it took away some women to come in. Really? Then you had Infinity War at a 28 more million this week, $600 million almost domestic, 595 And you still had Black Panther. And Black Panther had no competition. Black Panther right now domestic under $700 million. And now starting to be available for home viewing. So now what people are going to be worrying about is what's going to happen with Solo, a Star Wars story. How it will coexist against Deadpool 2. Solo is expected to open to at least $100 million. But it's very top heavy. You got a lot of the movies that are coming out for the Memorial Day weekend box office. Book club for the older crowd. That's uh, with a lot of female ladies that are, you know, they, they're, they're names still. Okay, you got Jane Fonda, Diane Keaton, Candace Berg, and Mary Steenburgen. Averaging over seven years old. Then you have Snow Dogs that came in last week at $6 million. Quiet Place still continues to do well. $300 million domestic. And the openings for this week, we had Deadpool number one, Avengers number two, Book Club. Actually, these are movies that already come out. So... One movie is expected to go ahead and release, and that is the solo movie. The other movies you have that are also a part of this, you got Life of the Party, Melissa McCarthy, you got Breaking In as part of this, and the movie Rampage still continues to be out there. So when you're going to the theaters, you're going to probably see a number of screens. What, about 80% of the screens are going to probably go towards either Deadpool 2 or Solo, when the bulk of them are going to go to Solo. That's just how it's going to be. Let's go on the TV. The networks, and this, oh, I'm going to go to the story that I saw here about the audience that's watching network TV. It's like watching cable news. They're getting older. This is from IGN. And the season's top 10 most popular shows on network TV have a predominantly older audience. According to the report from the New York Times, major networks like ACBS, ABC, NBC are struggling to attract younger audiences. Instead of choosing to consume their entertainment media on streaming services like Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. So here are the numbers. This is bad. All right. Are the top shows, The Good Doctor, which was what? A brand new show for this season. Average age, 58.6. Young Sheldon, brand new show this season. You'd think Big Bang would have a young audience. 57.4. The Voice, you'd think that would be a lot of young people watching that show. 57.3 years old. Big Bang Theory, 56 years old. Then you move along. 911, 53.5 years old. It's a brand new show. Grey's Anatomy, 53.1. Roseanne, 52.9. This is us. You'd think there'd be like a lot of millennials watching. No, 52.6 years old, average age. Willie Grace, 52.2 years old. The youngest in the top 10, Empire. Oh, they're just, they're just wet behind the ears. 47.8 years old. And of network shows, period. Riverdale has the youngest audience, 37.2 years old. The CW, that's just not good. And so with these older viewers, what are you going to come up with with something new and different? Which, you know, that kind of goes into the whole creative process where Creativity is not going to come into network TV anymore. Meanwhile, there's the room for it, right? You'd think there was. But for whatever reason, there's not anymore. I don't know. There's a lot of issues right now where you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to kind of build that audience back? It's like 
you have all this space. That's why what's interesting now is WWE in 2019 will be moving their SmackDown Live program to Fox Television. And Fox is going on an approach for their fall of next year. They're going to carry Thursday Night Football. They're going to carry Thursday Night Football this season on Thursday nights, which will bring a younger audience and more of an 18 to 49 demographic that they want. They're also going to take Friday nights and give it to SmackDown Live professional wrestling, which still does get an older audience, but still gets more younger viewers. It's still, I would think you'd probably get more of like a 30 to 40 year old on average demographic for that show. Maybe more kids, maybe more teenagers. That would be helpful. And then they're going to run college football like they've always done on Saturday nights. It's quite interesting. They're going to have three nights of live sports or sports entertainment. They're just they're basically giving up on the idea of going for creative programming. That's just not going to bolster a rating. They just don't want to go that route. And it's quite interesting they're going to go that route. Now, Variety.com writes about how the networks are going back to basics amid, uh, amid merger mania. Recent years have seen the network programmers place greater and greater emphasis on broad portfolios and multi-platform presence. Several digital competitors, though, have been successfully siphoning ad dollars from television for years and have recently been staggered by controversy. So this, in prior, the prior, prior years, the rush towards data and digital and all things new and shiny was what were the newer networks which want to do? You know, having their own, you know, let's promote the apps. Let's promote their, their you know, premium services like CBS All Access. Well, this year was a little bit of getting back into what you're good at for the presenters. No mention of data, much more back to news shows and why broadcast TV does what it does. High reach and high quality. So the most interesting theme which was talked about in the story, was the humanity aspect, how each of the networks tried to package their offerings around a sort of human emotion and start contrast to the digital landscape, which, like for a better term, is pixelated and an unsafe environment for your advertisers. Palace intrigue at CBS cast a shadow across not just the network's presentation, but all the broadcasters. See, now CBS is dealing with an issue where against, with a lawsuit that was against their primary shareholder, Sherry Redstone, the uh, wife of Summer Redstone, seeking to block her efforts to merge the company with Viacom. And then this network's drama added to the sense of uncertainty across the TV businesses created by the recent rush of, merger, rush of mergers and acquisitions. AT&T, Time Warner, Sinclair and Tribune, CBS, Viacom, and Disney, and Fox. Four major mergers. Fox CEO said, we want to welcome you to the new Fox. An exciting opportunity for our network. We have an exciting opportunity to chart a new course for broadcast television. The schedule that Fox presented was heavy on the staples of broadcast television. Scripted programs and football in the fall. Unscripted shows at mid-season and summer. And talking about the Disney possible acquisition of much of 21st century Fox, how it affected planning, Howard Kurtzman, co-president of 20th Century Fox Television, told Variety, quote, simply stated, we've been told business is usual. That's the way we've conducted ourselves. Our development strategy did not change. Our pilot production strategy didn't change. We continue to do what we've done. Now, the idea of bringing back other shows, the reboots, or the revivals. Roseanne is sort of the beachhead, according to Johnny Davis, a counterpart with Howard Kurtzman at Fox. He says, quote, or she, she says, excuse me, quote, you're looking at Murphy Brown. Then you see Magnum P.I., which, oh, I got to talk about Magnum P.I. What a horrible idea for a show. I saw the trailer. Jay Hernandez as nothing, even resembling what Tom Selleck has to charm personality or presence or leading leading man credibility and Higgins is a woman and having this like young woman computer hacker know-it-all kind of deal 
it just looks bad. It looks really bad. I will give it one episode, but I don't have any faith in it. I mean, it's not like they did what they did with Hawaii Five-0, which they kept it. I mean, they did what they did with it, and Hawaii Five-0 has lasted for a long time and continues to be on. And they put on a good night where it's familiar enough to be watched, and it doesn't it doesn't hurt the original showing of Hawaii Five-0. But this Magnum PI is is reckless. It's bad. It just, it looks like you're just taking what sounded like a good concept, stripping it of what was good about it, what was the real jovialness of the show, the real, I mean, the the, the differences that they had with Higgins being this older man that was just, you know, probably was Robin Masters for all we know, and Jay Hernandez, and oh, look at him, oh, these replaceable Ferraris. So let's just get the Ferrari. Let's just get Jay Hernandez in a Ferrari. Let him drive around in Hawaii. Let's let him, oh, let's let him go ahead and, uh, you know, let's get the helicopter out there with TC. Let's just do that. Oh, all this high-tech extra gear. It's sad. And then the guy you had that playing Rick. He's, he's, you don't know how to, it's so easy to cast the characters. Just do what you did before. If you're going to do this again, at least go that route. But, oh, no, they can't do that. Anyways. So you're looking at Murphy Brown, then you see Magnus P.I. If you're going to bring back programming like this again, you've got to, you've got to make it good, and you've got to make a case for why it's useful in this world right now. Now, one of the other things they're going to talk about is the fact that not only are you going to have Roseanne returning, Last Man Standing gets a chance to come back on the air once again with Tim Allen. And listen, regardless of what they want to say about the conservative values and narrative of those of Roseanne and Last Man Standing, let's just let's not just go ahead and overlook the fact that Roseanne and Tim Allen are very good comedians that have done very successful shows. Okay, Roseanne, for a long time I've talked about how well did that show do as a top five show throughout most of his run. Tim Allen had home improvement before that. Also, a show that did tremendously well in the ratings for a long time, which notably, I noticed, I was watching uh, some things out of the Rodney Dangerfield channel on YouTube, and you got to remember, Rodney Dangerfield, God bless, man, that guy brought in everybody. Sam Kennison, Andrew Dice Clay, Roseanne Barr, Jerry Seinfeld, Bill Hicks, I mean, he had just a plethora, Tim Allen, a plethora of great talent, which also would end up going on Johnny Carson, things like that. And they were just great. And it's just, it's amazing how well all these actors and actresses are doing, uh, that were comedians. And those comedians are still standing strong today. And we're talking about these shows when Home Improvement was also a little bit after Roseanne started. We're talking about shows that are 25 years old. And we're still having to go ahead and, and the revivals are shows like this of these stars because they're still funny. There's nobody else to replace them. There is no one else strong enough to bring a comedy show on or a sitcom to bring forward and to get people on to watch with the kind of audience that these shows are going to get. Because I'm telling you, Last Man City, with all that push, where we're getting it canceled, getting it brought back, what happens is when you do it, it's just like when Family Guy got brought back, when Roseanne got brought back. The numbers just go up because you have an audience that is fighting to keep the show on the air. And look what look at Brooklyn Nine-Nine on the acts of getting canceled by Fox and then the next day would get picked up by NBC. And that show's going to probably get better ratings next year. And probably because Brooklyn Nine Nine probably put on a better night. They won't be pushing it around like they did before. Remember that Fox moved it on Tuesdays and they moved it to Sundays this halfway the last season. But the problem is too is that all their comedies suffered. They were all doing bad. I'm still upset that LA to Vegas got canceled. Stupid. I really enjoyed that show too. It's just Fox show, Fox comedies just go ahead and just they crumble because there's just nothing there. All right, move on to music and radio. A couple of things about this. So, there was a convention 
called non-com that happened last week. An all-female panel talked about calling for gender equality in music radio. Okay. Let me just move along to what's actually said here. The all-female panel, which included, let's see, Shannon Curlander, head of radio promotion at marketing firm Terrorbird, Liz Felix, director of communications for the show Bird Note in Seattle, Jesse Witten, music director of Colorado Public Radio's Open Air, moderator Lindsay Kimball, host and assistant PD with The Current in Minneapolis, and Talia Schlanger, host of WXPN's World Cafe. So these are mostly NPR-type programming, public radio. So non-convention is an event for public radio music stations. And the title of this presentation was She Persisted. A conversation dealt with challenges facing women trying to move up the ranks in the industry. They suggested ways station leaders and others can change their work and mindsets to be more inclusive and supportive of women. Spoke to a mostly male audience that included a few people of color. The panel included none. Panelists discussed perceptions in music radio that stations will turn off listeners if they play too much music by women or play songs by female artists back to back. Female is not a new musical genre, according to the panelists, so stations ensure that women are a regular presence on the air and give an equal time and space with male performers. And I just think that's just, I don't even understand what they're trying to, trying to go with with that. Music is what it is. I mean, listen. So you're telling me that artists like you know Taylor Swift and Beyonce and Ariana Grande and you know Camila Cabello and others, you're telling me they're not, or, or even Mayor Morris these days, you're telling me they're not getting enough play? Dua Lipa? Really? I never heard that complaint before. Plus also, these are people that are out of their league talking about music radio when they are public radio types. Okay? So they're, I mean, how much, how often in their own lives, in their own experience, do they listen to music radio? I mean, you could say something about that when it comes to rock music, but there's not a whole lot of rock out there. No alternative, really. You have, what else? Rap music? Well, I'm sorry. You know what? <laughs> you got Cardi B and Nicki Minaj running running world, uh, and Beyonce running on top of R&B and hip-hop, right? Just don't get that. John Hart, music director at KTBG in Kansas City, Missouri, says the music industry isn't likely to respond to appeals uh, uh, to justice. What they give about, what they give a shit about, is money. What they, what we need to do is create hits. This is a copycat industry. If we play women and we show that they make money, other formats will pick this up. And then somebody, and then the same program director, or sorry, the same uh, music director. Talked about he feels guilty about blacks, about Hispanics. But the most underrepresented group at our station has been women, even though we do better than other stations. I want to find out what the hell is this station he's talking about. <clears throat> KTBG is the bridge. It's a listener-supported radio station in Warrensburg, Missouri. <sighs> it's public radio. These people are out of their minds. What are they talking about music radio when they're on public radio? They're public supported. Your audience wants to listen to what the crap you're listening to. They're not listening to your station. Not even close. Kansas City has other stations to listen to besides you, besides the bridge. This, this, it's just, it's stupid. Now, Panelists said station programmers often think they program more women than other stations do, even though they're just playing a handful. There should be a vision created for the station and considering what the results should be rather than just what's better. They said there's a lack of female leadership in programming and on air are issues that should be tackled separately. Is it just public radio? Listen, public radio is a bastion for social justice and equality, isn't it? Or are they just kind of colluded because of all the harassment 
of sexual harassment and Me Too movement issues with a number of people that have been fired or had to leave NPR because of their their pieces of crap. Tom Ashbrook, Garrison Keillor, Charlie Rose. Okay. Public radio is just another thing of its own. But I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we've had female disc jockeys, you know, run midday shifts or, or morning shifts or what have you for decades. There is no issue of doing anything when it comes to women and radio on mainstream radio, on traditional terrestrial radio. It's all out there. Okay. It is. I mean, morning shows are not hurting at all with women out there. Many women work very well, in some cases, hosting the shows on morning radio. And throughout the shifts, you know, look at all the major radio stations around the country, major markets. They all are. Lots of women. I mean, it's programming the fact that you need more women on the air anyway on all these pop stations to relate to the audience. It's just the way it is. I know in my market, for a matter of fact, there's a lot of women on the air right now. And when it comes to the music, it's just what is hot. I just don't understand this story and how they came from, how they feel like there's supposed to be something with gender and diversity. But that's their problem in public radio. Public radio's problem. It's not ours. Sucks to be them. They should go listen to music radio, real music radio, not what they're putting out there. They're complaining about themselves. They're complaining about themselves. A place is supposed to probably have gender fluidity and diversity and inclusion of all races and cultures and creeds. Does NPR really represent that? Some of the reporters I hear on like Marketplace and things like that, right? Or all things considered. Otherwise, what else? I mean, I maybe I'm making more of this this article than it is, but it just I just thought it was really ridiculous when I read that. Now another thing, podcasters out there. Well, I'm king of podcasts. That's what I call myself, right? Well, I thought it would be very interesting to talk about a story that came up out of Edison Research last week, talking about fixing podcasting's music problem, because a lot of you are actually asking about what music you're allowed to use in your podcasts. Well, let's talk about that. So this story is from Tom Webster. He writes, when I speak to audiences of podcasters, I often joke that if you feature licensed music in your podcast, a lawyer will shoot you in the face. Well, this week, I got to speak in front of a room full of the people that ordered the hit music industry executives. Oh, ordered the hit music industry executives. He keynoted the podcasting track at... Music Biz 2018 in Nashville. Now, there have always been music podcasts. They're just difficult. And he mentions a couple of uh, shows. In their cases, they had to individually clear the rights for every song. So there, there are some very popular music podcasts, but they often come directly from labels or artists who can successfully clear and or monetize licensed music. Two of the shows he brings up are Group Therapy and Arjuna Deep Editions, shows produced by the labels that own much of the music feature. Music podcasts could and should be successful. So because listeners listen, 77% of our time listening to music, 23% listening to spoken word audio. But there's no clear path for the average podcast producer to include licensed music on podcasts. There's still a confusion out there amongst podcasters about using licensed music. Nearly every day in the various Facebook, so do I, some in their show because it's fair use. Fair use is a legal term, not a general sense of fairness. And let me tell you, there's almost nothing you can think of in terms of podcasting licensed music that is considered fair use. So he goes and talks to David Oxenford, who summarizes the main issues about this. <clears throat> so back when podcasting was a Rube Goldbergian system of pulleys and gears to download a file and sync it with your shuffle, 
Podcasting music was essentially like printing your own CDs, which means paying every royalty you could think of. But things have changed, both in music and podcasting. Spotify Mobile lets you catch cash songs, cache songs, which is functionally like downloading them since you can keep them as long as you are a subscriber. More importantly, both Spotify and Pandora are ramping up their podcast content. Spotify is already claiming a spot as one of the leading podcast clients after the Apple ecosystem. There's nothing downloaded about a podcast from Pandora or Spotify. It's functionally streamed, just like the music. There's not much that makes a show on these streaming services a podcast, other than it's saying it is a podcast. Technology has changed. And with it, so is the relevance of some of the various rights and licenses surrounding the performance. So they kind of give some stats here. I'm going to pass that. Basically, figuring out a simple way to license music for podcasts is a win-win for everyone involved. Lowering the barriers here will result in more music, more royalties, and better podcasts. And I can tell you from experience, doing a music podcast without actually being able to play music is like ordering the tasting menu at Gotham and spending the rest of the night having the dishes described to you in detail, but not actually served. For my fellow podcasters, you want this to happen. Being legally impaired against frictionless use of music and podcasts locks you out of the earbuds of millions of Americans. Fix this and watch podcasting explode. He's right. He's absolutely right. I mean, I haven't really had a chance to hear what's been done when it comes to music out there. I mean, I know Billboard must have something where they're able to go and do certain things where they can play clips of songs. And there's a couple of shows that do that that I listen to. There's also Switched on Pop is a really popular uh, is a show that I listen to as well where they break down new songs and you get to hear what the songs are all about and what makes the song the song from the instrumental point of view. Breaking down all the elements as if you're assembling the song again. For Billboard, they have their own chart podcasts. They have, you know, all these different things. But again, it's probably like what they said. They probably have to go and sign off every time on this. But this is a part of the thing where podcasting has to deal with royalties. And in the digital space, what the problem is is that we've had a lot of people upset in the music industry about not being paid. I'll tell you an interesting interview that I wa- I, listened, I watched a little bit on YouTube. Of course, the podcast was Joe Rogan, who was king dingling of podcasts. You still think it was Adam Carolla, but now it is Joe Rogan. I feel like that guy is like unstoppable. Well, Stephen Tyler Edward Smith was on complaining about the music royalties and how, in general, the music industry is just screwed because... Any of the money was maybe an artist or a musician anymore. Not only they're going to lose the money on their record because they're not going to be able to make any money off, money off of it because of how digital streaming doesn't pay out pay out enough, right? You have that, and then you have whatever you make on concerts or merchandise. Because the music industry learned, listen, if they're going to not make money off of units of music anymore, well, then they're just going to just start taking a bigger cut of everything else. And they're going to include it all into the contract that you sign with your blood. That's basically what it is. That's what it's come down to. And now you're in a bad place because you're saying to yourself, well, this sucks. You know, it's because of that. And, And listen, it's a lot of problems that are out there. But when you look at it, We have to look at copyright reform. We have to look at what needs to be done to help artists get their, get what they deserve. Basically, what it is. So, the musicians are out there talking to Congress. They talked to them last week, namely, music legend Smokey Robinson. They urged Congress last week to pass the first major music copyright reform law in decades. Because many songwriters are struggling financially because they are not being adequately paid for the use of their songs. Many songwriters can no longer make a living off the royalties they receive for their music. People don't buy music anymore. They stream it, according to John Keir, who wrote the two songs, Carrie Underwood's song, Before He Cheats, and Lady Antebellum's hit, Need You Now. 
legislation before the Senate would drastically change the way digital music companies obtain a license to play songs and ensure that songwriters are paid when their music is played. The Music Modernization Act would create a new music licensing organization run by publishers and songwriters that would be in charge of identifying a composition's copyright owners and paying them royalties they are due. The legislation also would create a new standard for the rate-settling court to use to determine the fair royalty rate songwriters should be paid. In addition, the proposal would guarantee that artists and labels are paid for songs recorded before 1972 when their music is played on the internet and satellite radio. It would also codify record producers and engineers' rights to digital royalties. The House passed this legislation late last month and has widespread support in the music industry. Smokey Robinson said the right to collect royalties on music recorded before 1972 is especially important for writers of many classic songs. Congress extended copyright protection to music in the 1970s, but the change applied only to recordings made after February 15, 1972. As a result, the writers of many classic songs don't get paid when their music is played on satellite radio and on digital streaming services. Many of those writers are in an age where their careers are winding down. They're no longer, no longer able to tour, make public appearances, or record new material to earn a living, according to Robinson. Quote, they should be able to rely on income from the recordings used by digital radio companies to attract listeners and earn profits. For so many, especially at this point in their careers, this is how they make their ends meet. It's how they pay their mortgage and their medical bills. It's how they feed their families. And here's the thing. And they're getting nothing on the royalties. Smokey Robinson sued for a quarter million dollars on royalties, only got twelve thousand. John Keir got only three thousand royalties, three thousand royalties from streaming songs like "Before He Cheats" and "Need You Now." Keir is a four-time Grammy Award winner who also wrote chart-topping songs for Tim McGraw, Taylor Swift, and Dirk Bentley. And strong running for him is not a hobby; it's his job. And basically, Congress is saying music licensing issues are right for reform. And I have to agree with this. And listen, it's it's up, the duty has to be towards the digital streamers. And I got to believe this, and I'm, 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 call me crazy. So I've been a Spotify subscriber for over a year now. $10 a month is an incredible deal. And, and actually buying it for a year at $99 is even more incredible. But I'll tell you what, I mean, I wish that there would be royalties that would be better paid towards these artists because we knew need more musicians out there willing to go out there and, and be driven to be paid for such great work. Music is so important to us. And for all it's worth, I mean that's what I used to as a you know as a as a DJ or as a, as a radio uh, host you know as an MC as a person working on the radio on air you know and programming the music I wanted the best music to come up on top but more importantly I like to make sure they also get themselves paid so any station that carries them you know pay your licensing fees pay your BMI and ASCAP accordingly and when it comes to all of us you know. The days of buying the music in the stores are long gone. And, you know, that's the fault of the music industry for not being prepared. They weren't prepared for Napster. They weren't prepared for technology. That's their fault. So they took a hit for this. But they've taken a hit long enough. They've taken a hit for 20 years now. Now it's time for the musicians to start getting back what they deserve. They're going to be able to go and get their back track of royalties, but they should be able to get their royalties for now. Okay, that's what needs to happen. And, you know, if you have people that are out there that are trying to listen to music, you know, don't, you don't want to go and, what you don't want to do is bury the radio stations with lots of copyright payments. The copyright shouldn't be, the royalty should not be paid so much by the radio stations as much. Because they're promoting your music. You want that promotional tool without having to get overly paid for it. What you want to be able to do is make what you used to do on royalties, 
which was off of record sales. That's where you get your real money. And so I would be more than willing if Spotify or Apple or Amazon Music or others, listen, Amazon Prime's already going to go up and pay. I'm, I'm not having a problem paying for it. Okay, it's a yearly push for me to take Amazon Prime, and I make what I need off of it. And I still come under the fact that for those of you that listen on free trial platforms for Spotify and others, well, I'll just say this. Listen, you know, there was a time where I used to pay $16, $18 at the end of the run of music to, and I never usually picked up the a new album unless it had at least three or four songs on it. So the musicians had to really put out a bona fide album for me to buy it. And even then, I would prefer to buy a compilation or buy a greatest hits. So you really have to put yourself out there and make yourself do something really good. But technology has made it so convenient for us. I mean, my God, I can listen to Billboard Hot 100 right now, and, and I'm just in glee. Or Fifth of Charts Top 100. Or I was listening to the reggaeton artists. Or Spanish music that was coming across that I could listen to on the way to the DR for my vacation. And just to say to myself, and, and also watching on YouTube as well. It's just, it's worth it. I mean, listen, for what you get off of that, the royalties you get off of that, you just need to be able to make it where the streaming sources, I mean, I hate to say it, they should bump up their monthly fees. And they should force more people to accept buying a subscription. Put money into the music you're listening to. Because it's true. You know what? There is something to be said about the pirating that's out there. I mean, let radio and music be able to do what they normally do. You know, if payola was a thing back then, it should still be. At one point, I thought payola was a bad thing. I was so wrong about that. Because if you could put your money where your where your mouth was about an artist and you're willing to put some dollars in there into a DJ's pocket or a music director's pocket just to get that song played on the air, then you did it. The digital streamers have given us great technology. Spotify is is so good. But you seriously got to say to yourself, you know you're getting away with murder we're just getting away with with such a great deal right now on how we get to stream our music to all of you. All of you that get to stream your music every week, every day. I mean, I thought about it. I mean, I remember looking at what Spotify told me last year. I listened to 15,000 songs. Imagine if I had to listen to it in CD form. Now, radio would also make a comeback if streaming was a little more cost efficient. If you had to charge a more higher price but it would still be worth it. If Spotify were $15 a month, it would still be very much worth it. If it were $20 a month, I'd still think it was worth it. That's how I feel about it. Music's very important to me. I listen to Spotify every day. And I'll, I, and you know what? When the radio continues to be bad as it is and controlled and regulated and, and just horrible... I'm going to go to music streaming. And, you know, it's a matter of you do it twofold. The musicians work with the radio stations, cut the copyrights down. Cut down the prices of the copyrights because it's going to be better in the long run for them. And you put the prices onto the subscribers. The people that would normally have bought your music in the record stores that are now buying it this way. And I'll tell you, yeah, hey, I'd prefer to do it this way and listen to albums when I think there's something really good that comes up to the cream of the crop. Or if you want to listen to albums, then there you have it. But my whole deal is I'd rather prefer to listen to my music this way, but I wouldn't mind paying what I used to pay every month at the record store to get music because that's all it was. I like to listen to new music, and I would do it. And I thought that was something that was good. And in the quality we're getting, come on, look at what we're getting. It's so great. and so easy for us to listen to. You know, we're getting away with it. And we should be willing to invest into better music and better musicians. So we need to make 
the environment better for musicians to be able to get paid so they'll be willing to put their craft out there for all of us to enjoy. And that's your Creative Now Corporate Podcast for this week. Thank you all for tuning in. And until next time, please remember, keep your creative as far as you can from your corporate. I'm out. Thank you for listening to the Creative Not Corporate Pop Culture and Media Podcast. To learn where to subscribe to the show and how to follow the king of podcasts anywhere on social media, go to our website at creativenotcorporate.com. That's creativenotcorporate.com. The Creative Not Corporate Podcast is brought to you by Amazon. Shop where the king of podcasts shops for everything and anything he needs by going to kingofpodcasts.com slash Amazon. Also, check out the King of Podcasts' work every day at webmasterradio.fm and cannabisradio.com. And look for his other original podcast series, The Wrestling is Real Podcast. Learn about these and more at kingofpodcasts.com.